You're watching. You're watching. You're watching. You're watching West Hartford. West Hartford Community Television. Community Television. Community Television. For the community. 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 By the community. By the community. By the community. By the community. For the community. By the community. And it's a wrap. Hi, and thanks for joining me on a very special edition of Two Guys and a Lot of Wine. I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And I'm very pleased and honored to have Attorney Jerry Farrell, Jr. on our show, who used to be the former Commissioner of Consumer Protection and knows a lot about Connecticut liquor laws, which we all know are kind of crazy. And we're also going to be discussing the Noble Grape tonight. That's yeah. right. There are six varietals that are referred to as the Noble Grapes. And this comes to us from the era of King Louis XIV, when he was the King of France. He was trying to promote French culture across the world. And so as, uh, as part of that program, he wanted to get French wines uh, consumed around the world. And so tonight we're going to be drinking, uh, starting, well, we're not going to have yeah, time to drink all of these. Them. <laughs> but uh, the six varietals are Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, Riesling, Pinot Noir, Merlot, and Cabernet Sauvignon. And we're going to get through as many of these as possible tonight, but we've got a lot to talk about with Jerry. So. We do, and I think uh, our first actual wine, Jerry, and then we'll go right into some questions, is actually a Italian Chardonnay. It is a blend, but it's another example of the noble grape being so versatile that the Italians can grow a Chardonnay grape too. And it's also blended with the Garganega grape, so you're still going to get the Chardonnay flavor, but probably not as buttery as you might get in California, but it's still Chardonnay. So I'm very curious to see how that might uh, taste with your experience mm. to Italian white wine. So before we even taste the white wine, though, I think uh, what Jim and I were talking about earlier is just how difficult it is to get into the wine business here in Connecticut. Well, uh, not a week goes by that somebody doesn't call me that they want to become a wine importer, a wine wholesaler. And I have to tell them, you know, it's a six month process that we're going to have to go get federal licenses for you, state licenses for you. We're gonna to have to take each one of your products and get your labels approved on both a federal basis and a state basis. Labels approved, wow. Labels approved. Um, both the feds and the state wanna know where the wine's coming from, what circumstances it's coming in the door. Um, so we help clients with all those kind of compliance issues. And they've also got a list of alcohol percentage on there. And how do they go about measuring that? Um, one of the things that when I'm talking with the client is I say, we better send your bottles for testing quick because um, TTB, which is the federal agency and the state of Connecticut, are going to look for test results. And there's a limited number of companies out there, laboratories, that do this kind of testing. And you want to make sure you get your bottles in and you get them tested because that could be the fly in the ointment in your your approval not going forward. So you never rely on just the customer's word. Hey, it's only 13 percent. You know, in some cases there is a track record elsewhere in the United States that we can rely on. Oh, but okay. typically when somebody's bringing in something from abroad, it's a new kind of product and we have to send it out for testing. And how much does it cost to get each label approved? Is this something expensive? Well, I mean, putting aside my services and what you would pay me, to Connecticut, you're talking $200 a label. Per label. Um, so, so if you're offering all six of the noble grapes, you're uh, out 1200 bucks. There you have it. Okay. That's very interesting. I did not realize the prices were that high. Yeah. You know, and that'll take me right into, as we go into our first taste, I wanted to add a little bit more to the, the noble grape. And people are probably saying, once again, what does that mean? It, it basically, the grapes we're talking about have been around for so long that it, it's sort of the, the reference is sort of royalty. They're the royalty of the grapes. They are. And it, it's also a play off of King Louis XIV's court, that these were the grapes that the nobles in his court were drinking. 
And actually, Jim, I also read that you always have the French to thank. As you know, I love French wine. I'm always exalting French wine. The French are responsible for most of the, the Noble grapes, if not all of them, except for one. The Riesling was, is from Germany, but That's everything correct. else has a really good track record of growing in France. But the reason, the other reason that we call these the Noble grapes today is because they grow just about everywhere, uh, with the exception of Pinot Noir, which yes. is really finicky and so the to a lesser extent. Thing. Yeah. It's very difficult to yeah. make a good Pinot Noir. But you, you look at Sauvignon Blanc, uh, you can find that anywhere in the world, and, and we've got one from uh, New Zealand today. And you look at uh, Chardonnay, and those, you know, California makes great Chardonnays too. And we've got one from Italy tonight. Which Jerry just came back from recently, so I'm kind of curious mm -hmm. to see how he's going to like this or not like this. And Jerry, you do not have to lie. If you, you can tell me, Bob, this is awful. There is no problem. I'll be there. honest. Yeah, be so honest. We get some stinkers on the we show do. from time to time. Well, most it's me that has the stinkers, by the way. So let's give it a shot. Give it a shot. So this is Chardonnay from Italy. And it's, uh, you said this blend was. 25% Chard? It's 15% Chard and 85% okay. Garganego. But I got to tell you, I get the Chardonnay right off the bat. Up front. But it's got a, a real interesting bite to it that you normally wouldn't get from a Chardonnay. Right. And right. it's got to be exactly. that other grape. You know, I think that is an example also because every, every wine here is different. There's a different varietal. You're getting the terroir. You're getting mm -hmm. an Italian taste here, I think, probably. Well, obviously, the Garganego grape is, what, is probably what's giving it that little zing. But there's still enough in here to get the Chardonnay at the same time. This would be confusing if I was tasting this blind because I would almost assume it's a Sauvignon Blanc, but it, it doesn't start like a Sauvignon Blanc. That's the Chardonnay coming through at the beginning. It definitely starts as a Chardonnay right off the bat. It really does. So I, I, I like it. I do. I think there's a place for that. Uh, I think uh, the average consumer who likes a Chardonnay might go for something like that. I could even see Sauvignon Blanc drinkers steering towards this. If, they, you know, if they're looking for something different, um, it's, yeah, it's a little smooth or, or creamy at the front. There's is, a little creaminess at the which, front. Which you don't normally get from a Sauvignon Blanc. I'm really enjoying this wine. Thanks for bringing this. Well, one. keep enjoying it, because let's get into our <laughs> next legal discussion. We, we covered a little bit about, as Jerry was saying, labeling. Uh, what are some of the other things, Jim, I know you were interested about in regards to importation? Well, we were, we were talking uh, before the show about uh, how France views wine as a food and, and regulates it more like a food than an alcohol. And here in the United States, uh, we look at wine and we say that's alcohol and that's how we regulate it. Highly regulated in this country that, you know, we've gone through two constitutional amendments, you know, to the United States Constitution on alcohol. There's no other product that's been so regulated in the history of the United Astounding. States. Mm -hmm. um, but here it is in Connecticut. And, you know, we are one of the states that has pretty tight controls. We have what's called a three-tier system where you have manufacturers, you have wholesalers, and you have re retailers. And none of those uh, tiers can meet. If you're a retailer, you can't be in the manufacturing industry in most cases. So how does this work uh, for Connecticut winemakers? They're growing grapes on their property, producing wine, and then you go to their tasting room and they're, they're able to, to pour some for you and send you home with a bottle or two if you like it. Yeah, the law I think is pretty favorable to farm wineries in Connecticut that they're able to offer tastings, they're able to sell you the bottle. That's not quite as true for some of um, the other kinds of uh, alcoholic beverages mm -hmm. that are out there. The, the law that deals with spirits, for instance. We have a very beginning spirits industry here in Connecticut, um, and yet they don't have quite the favorable laws that farm wineries do. So they There's can't do ways tastings. around it. They can't, you can't go to a, a spirits producer here in Connecticut and do a tasting on They premises. can do a, a limited number of tastings, but then in terms of, oh, I'd like to buy a full glass. I'd yeah. like to have a cocktail. You start getting on uh, shakier ground. There's ways that if you know you hire the right attorney, mm -hmm. you can figure these things out, but they're not necessarily easy. So are there a lot of different licenses? There are 60 different <sighs> liquor licenses uh. in the state of Connecticut. You know, some of it's a simple distinction of you have restaurants, cafes, and taverns. You know, it all goes to, you know, the size and type of the eating facility. But then you have public art museum liquor licenses that um, we just did one for the Mark Twain House in Hartford. 
Um, not a whole lot of those licenses being mm. given out, but now you can go to an event at the Mark Twain house and uh, have a glass of wine. You know, I, I'm curious also about how that incorporates into um, facilities that allow BYOB. Because those, I've always been curious, are they regulated? If a restaurant starts off as a BYOB, are there licenses that are involved with going BYOB? Not really. You know, there may be some zoning issues, um, but from a state liquor perspective, there is no such license as a BYOB. You're just licensed less in that instance. You know, if somebody's going into the restaurant business and wants to do that, I got to caution them of, okay, customers can bring their own bottle, but please make sure your staff doesn't touch it because the more that your staff, you know, touches the bottle, touches the glass, mm -hmm. the more that the need for a license becomes apparent and the that liability becomes apparent. So how do, they, apparent. how do they get away with charging a corkage fee then if you're telling them not to, or are they flirting with danger when they do that? If you're liability? Be YOB, I don't know why you're charging a corkage fee because you're, you're then reaching really into, well, you're making money off of liquor. Mm -hmm. You know, is yeah. a license needed? Do you need dram shop insurance? Dram shop insurance is liability insurance for someone who sells alcohol. Well, I thought you were BYOB. Okay. You know, why do you want to go down this road? So if I, so if I go to a restaurant and, and it's BYOB and I bring my own bottle and they charge me a corkage fee, can I contest that or should I just I pay the fee and not make a stink about it? I would I probably pay the fee because I still like bringing my own bottle occasionally. I do too. I don't want the restaurant and to I, get mad at me. Right. I want to eat the food. But Jerry makes a very interesting point because uh, I never thought about the amount of people that are actually start touching or involved with I, the wine, with the glass. That is part of what you regulate. Right. So, you know, you, you find those instances, give me a call. It's a business opportunity mm -hmm. for me to call okay. them up and say, <laughs> um, I think you should rethink this. Okay. Well, I actually live in Boston now, and Boston, up until this year, uh, had said there was no BYOB allowed within city limits. So in, no restaurants were able to, to let you bring a bottle in. And they're starting to regulate that now, and they are actually licensing that, so you have to apply for a separate BYOB permit. Which is it once surprised me to see Connecticut do that, because the State Liquor Commission just took away a liquor permit and the place opened up as BYOB and that's causing a lot of agita. So I wouldn't be surprised to see a legislator propose some type of license that goes to the BYOB issue. So uh, another revenue stream for Governor Malloy. Yes, more, more <laughs> revenue. That's, yeah, we need a lot of it. So Jerry saw his little wine lift, Jim. Can you talk to a little bit about the uh, Riesling that's coming up next? Uh, this is Jacob's Creek, and I've, I've talked so much about Jacob's Creek on this show in the six years we've been doing it. I recommend it Seven. all the time. Seven years. Seven years now, <laughs> yes. And I, I, this is one of the first Rieslings I ever tried. I fell in love with it right away. Uh, I'm always telling people if you're having spicy food, especially Thai food, uh, this is the pair you want to make. Uh, it cuts through the heat really well. Other grape varietals uh, kind of fade when you're eating something really spicy. Riesling's the way to go. And the other reason I recommend Jacob's Creek is because you find it everywhere. It's got such great distribution. Uh, you, there are, you can't walk into a liquor store or a wine store without finding this. Um, so it's, it pairs well with a lot of, lot of foods. Uh, Riesling is higher in acidity than any other grape varietal. So that cuts through heavy cream sauces, fatty meats, uh, and it works well with spicy food So also too. Italian food then, I mean, because there's some spicy Italian food. You could do, yeah, if you're having a Sausage spicy Italian spicy. dish. If you're having a red sauce, I wouldn't serve this. Yeah, not a red sauce. But uh, yeah, something spicy, absolutely. And as we discussed earlier, the Riesling, um, one of the noble grapes, though it technically isn't from France, there's, a, it sort of may be considered part of France because of the Alsace region, right? Yeah, and Alsace, if you, you think Alsace. back throughout history, Alsace has changed hands between Germany and France multiple times through the last couple of hundred years. So is it, a, is it a true French grape varietal? I'm going to say no. It's more of a German varietal. But the French grow really good Riesling in Alsace. Well, I, I know we sampled this earlier. And Jerry, uh, me and Jim sampled this. This is really good for Riesling. And I know we've talked about Rieslings on the show before. It's a good Riesling. It's a really nice and pleasant yep. Riesling. I, I hype Rieslings all the time, and people get scared of them because they think it's going to be sweet. And, and some of them are sweet, and justifiably so, but they, you know, they've got to leave some sugar in the wine to balance out all the acidity. Uh, but I think Jacob's Creek just nails this. They, they get just enough sugar and a lot of acidity. And actually, we haven't even discussed price point, then we're going to talk to Jerry about pricing. Um, the one that I brought in, the Saporito, 
which I have had before, they make a red and they make the Chardonnay, is actually under $11 for, for the bottle. Um, so that's a very reasonable price uh, for an Italian wine. I know sometimes uh, you can pay a lot for Italian wine, pay less for Italian wine. But I think that's a, that's a pretty reasonable price. Yeah, it's a great price point. The Lobster Point uh, is a little more expensive. That's in the $15 to $20 range. Yes. Yep. Um, I pay more for it in Boston than you do here in Connecticut, believe it or not. Usually it's the other way around. And actually, we'll discuss that as to the pricing. <laughs> and then the Jacobs Creek is under $10. So that's, you can't that's a great value, yeah. So the big question, Jerry, why I go to my local store and I buy the Jacobs Creek or the Saparito here, but then I just go over that little border in Massachusetts and all of a sudden everything's less. So I know there's a lot of technicalities in the answer, but to sum it all up, what drives the pricing? Well, I mean, the three-tier system that we have in Connecticut is a big piece of it. The, the three tiers, you have the manufacturer, the people who make the wine, the wholesaler who distributes the wine, and then the retailer, whether it's a package store who's selling it at retail or a restaurant that's selling it on premise. So as everybody touches it, you know, everybody's got to have a piece of the action. Mm -hmm. um, my clients in Italy, you know, I tell them, at the end of the day, somebody's going to want to buy something in the $13 range, meaning that you as the manufacturer are going to have to sell it for three euros, um, which, you know, is not a lot of money. But, hey, the wholesaler has to make their piece, the retailer has to make their piece, and then the consumer has to have something that is, is at a price point that is comfortable for them. And there's also transportation charges too. You got to put it on a boat and send it all the way over right. from Europe and then put it on a truck and get it to the store. And, and I think it, one of the things that confuses a lot of people, and even I get confused, and you know, one time, uh, the town that I grew up in, New Britain, was in the, actually uh, the Guinness Book of Records for actually having the most package stores for a city its size mm. in the United States. And I'm always curious, and I know the answer to this now, of course, but I'd like Jerry to explain, how could you have so many small mom and pop stores that actually are making money while you have these large package stores and big box stores that are also making money. How do they all make money? Um, you know, I think they try to distinguish themselves. There are some big, you know, big box kind of retailers out there um, that have their niche and you can go and find just about anything. They do a fair amount with what are called private label. But then you can go to some smaller places that they'll specialize. The, one of the ones around the corner from my home specializes in Italian wines that the owner really knows and brings in quite the selection of Italian wines. So he has his clientele. Um, so I think there's room for both. I mean, Connecticut law provides that by population, that each time the census comes out, that about a year later, the number of package stores is ad adjusted um, by population. So do they tell package stores they have to close down if the population drops? They're, they're not going to go out and close someone. The okay. question becomes if somebody goes out of business, is that license then available okay. anymore? Yeah. And it may no longer be if somebody drops the license. Typically, mm -hmm. if, if you're in a place and you're the last license and you're going to drop, it has economic value and right. you're able to do a deal with someone who wants it. Okay. All right, and can you talk a little about state minimum pricing? Uh, we don't have that in, in Massachusetts, but here in Connecticut, you know, the state has mandated you've got to sell this bottle of wine for X amount of dollars or higher. Yeah, I mean, min bottle, minimum bottle, as they call it. Um, you know, there's a lot of thoughts out there of whether that's right or wrong. Um, you know, it, it, it does, to some degree, some would argue, artificially inflate the market. Um, you know, but there are certainly a number of retailers out there that have developed uh, a good clientele around, you know, providing more consumer s service. Um, so I'm not necessarily somebody who, who slaps the concept of min bottle around. Okay. I know Total Wine has challenged that here in Connecticut on several occasions and paid the, pen the state penalty for challenging that. Uh, do you see this law changing at any point in the future? You know, the, the alcohol statutes in Connecticut have been around since 1934 when uh, Prohibition sent the issue back to the individual states. They don't get amended that they easily. They do not. No. Um, you know, there's so many special interests, for lack of a better term, of, you know, you have package stores, you have grocery stores that have beer permits, 
you have the wholesalers out there. They all have their own thoughts and they're not necessarily going to uh, seed turf to somebody mm -hmm. else. So that makes it very difficult to get the laws changed. Yeah. Even if something's innocent and, you know, viticulture classes. Um, we tried to amend the law to allow viticulture classes and the special interests beat that back and we could not do that. Oh. It never, never ceases to astound me. I mean, we, we supposedly live in a, a progressive state where, you know, with modern technology everywhere, yet we are still locked in to archaic viewpoints yeah. on liquor. Mm -hmm. And it's just astounding to me whenever I hear, you know, Jerry talking about this and there is the mindset that, you know, there, we can't change. This is the way it's always yeah. been done. Yeah. This is the way it will continue to be done. We can go to Mars, we can go to Venus, we can send spaceships out of the solar system, but we are not changing our liquor laws. And it's just fascinating to me that... Uh, yeah, just remember, we, we had no Sunday sales until... Th that's eight, true. Eight years ago? That years is ago. true, yes. I don't really think that really raised probably that much money, did it, though? People just sort of spread their buying power. That's what my bit. clients tell me, that, you know, and it raised their labor costs. Yeah. Um, so it really was a net negative to many people. But I... I always argue for the consumer, and I think a lot of these laws need to change just for consumer convenience and choice. And, and you see screwy laws like this across the country uh, that, that prevent people from getting the wines that they're looking for. They prevent them from buying on certain days or at certain hours. Uh, and it's, it hurts the consumer. All these laws hurt the consumer and benefit someone else. You know, the perspective, though, is that all 50 states have 50 different sets of laws, mm -hmm. and we can badmouth our own, but, you know, the grass is always greener on somebody else's side of the fence. That there are other states of, like, you have the control states, where, in effect, it's the state who is the purveyor mm -hmm. of liquor, and that has... It's upside and it's downside. It does have its downsides, yeah. yeah like no, New I, Hampshire, I lived, that's, uh, I lived in Pennsylvania, and they, they control right. all the liquor sales there. And, and uh, you know, so it's not market-driven at all. It's, you know, the state decides, hey, we're going to put a store here, and the people are going to have to come to it. Yeah, I lived it's, in Pennsylvania during law school, and their package stores are not that appealing. No. It's not <laughs> consumer-driven. They're ugly. They're dirty. Well, I think we should try our Pinot Noir, and I once again see Jerry has a little wine left. I'm sorry to keep making him drink That's too okay. fast, but all right, I, I have not tried this Pinot Noir. I got to be honest, I, I broke my own rule and, and bought something before I tried it. Uh, but I, I wanted to get this on the show because this is an Oregon Pinot Noir, and part of the theme for tonight was you know talking about these noble grapes just spreading across the globe. That's the other reason that they, they call these noble, is because they perform so well in so many different climates. And so you, you think of the true French Pinot Noir, you're talking about the Burgundy region of France. Uh, but Pinot Noir does really well in California, and I would argue even better in Oregon. That's what they say. And look at the color on this. That's for... Mm. It's, you know, it, this is what Pinot Noir is supposed to look like. It's, it's translucent. Uh, it's, it's still a, you know, a nice red color, but you can see right through it. Light body. Very light peppery bite to it. But you know you're drinking a Pinot Noir. Oh, it's fabulous. It's got a good creamy middle to it. And even though we didn't change glasses, you know, obviously there's a little white wine remnants yeah. left in there because of the uh, time situation. But I got to be honest with you, Jim, I, that's really good. I, I'm going to be buying a lot more of this. Really, this it's fabulous. definitely a place for that on the, uh, the old picnic table throughout yeah. the spring and summer, I think. And what's the price point on that one? Uh, that one is 15 to $20, probably, probably closer to 20 And that's actually considered kind of low for a good Pinot Noir. Yeah, for a really good Oregon Pinot Noir, sometimes you're talking fifty, sixty dollars a bottle. So this is this is a steal at the price. And Jerry, I wanted to ask you a question. I know we talked earlier. I like ordering wine from wine clubs sometimes, and I always thought that when you order a wine from a wine club, you're getting stuff that can't be sold in Connecticut. But that's not true, correct? They have to have a distributor that actually can sell that particular wine in Connecticut. Well, I mean, there's the whole direct to the consumer law, which, you know, there are many out of state entities that can ship direct to the consumer. So in most cases, a lot of those wine clubs are out of state entities that are taking advantage of being able to ship direct to a Connecticut consumer, which, you know, is something where we've changed the law to benefit the consumer and to take care of that gap and choice that's out there, that if there's really something you want and it's available elsewhere, even if you can't get it at a Connecticut retailer, you're going to be able to order it through the mail. That's actually my question. So is Connecticut making, I say I order a wine from a California wine club. I get a case sent to me. 
Where is Connecticut's cut of that pie? Where are they making any money? Well, they're certainly going to make sure the sales tax gets collected. Okay, that's obvious. Yeah. Um, it, and, you know, there's the whole deal that they have to have their label registered in Connecticut. So, there's 200 you know, bucks right there. Yeah. They're, okay. they're not <laughs> treated any differently on that score. Now, does, does that label have to get renewed every year, or can you just... Wow. Yes. Because you're, even, if it, even if you're not putting a vintage on that label... The whole question of vintage is an interesting one that we churn in our office of, you know, is the next vintage a different label yeah. that therefore we have to go register as a different label? So, and there's no distinct answer in, in my opinion. Sometimes we go based on, you know, what does the client think? Does the client want to raise their profile and raise other people's attention and get regulatory action mm -hmm. in their backyard. And yeah. most people come to the conclusion they don't. Right. Well, we talked earlier about different states having different laws, and I was just going to mention Indiana, which is another state where I lived for a while. Uh, they had a screwy law where if you were trying to ship wine into the state, you had to actually have a delivery truck registered in the state. To whether or not it was delivering the wine, you had to, you had to pay the state of Indiana for uh, a license and registration and a plate for the car. Unbelievable. Yeah. So just another screwy law that some state legislator came up with to probably just boost revenue. And We had talked about that in Connecticut when we amended um, the laws back about 10 years ago, but opted not to, to make people go through those paces. I didn't know this was something other states were considering. I thought this was just Yes, a, yeah, that wow. after the Costco line of decisions that dealt with um, wine crossing state lines. Mm -hmm. We amended the liquor control statute, and some of the proposals on the on the table were onerous. That um, you know you'd have to deal through uh, entities and go and pick it up rather than have it delivered in the mail. But luckily, Connecticut did see the sense of it can be delivered in the mail as long as the person who's delivering it make sure that they get you know, the person's signature and determine that they're of legal age to purchase. Okay. I've been through that, trying to be home and schedule it so the wine actually, yeah. you're there. A lot of times I just have it go right to the FedEx office and just go pick it up because it's almost impossible to be home, you know, when you're working to have signed for a package when it comes, so. Yeah, my wife got me a Wine of the Month Club as a gift too, and I was, I was in the same conundrum. How do, do, I, do I leave work early to go meet the guy for the delivery, or do I just have it delivered to the office if I'm not always in the office? Just have it go to the FedEx spot. Yeah. That's usually the best. That's a smart solution. You know, so in our remaining two minutes of the show, um, Jerry, I first want to thank you for being on the show because me and Jim have talked about all these aspects that we've discussed tonight many times. And did you always want to be in this area of law, or this is something that you just enjoy well, I practiced law for 25 years. I had been, you know, for a period of five years, the liquor commissioner. And then I came out and said, this is an underserved area. There's really not that many people that know this area of the law mm -hmm. and can assist people in answering the questions. So I've enjoyed it. I've had family members who are in the liquor trade. So intellectually, it's both challenging and sort of pleasing in its own way. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation tonight, and I feel like we're just starting to touch the surface. It is. There's so many other time. questions I have for you, but I, I want to thank you for coming on as well. And, Jim, thank you for coming down from Boston on a bad weather day like today, so I appreciate happy to, that. Happy to do it and you drink know, some great wine with I you. I know summer is really here, just around the corner, but uh, I hope both of you guys have a great summer. And, uh, Jerry, I hope to have you actu actually on again on the show. We can discuss what? different areas of, uh, that we might have missed tonight. And, Jim, we didn't get to all the wines tonight, but i got to say the three that we tried um, – very good. All this, is, this is a new low for us. I don't think we've ever just done three wines on a show. But, you know, I had a feeling when going into this show that might be the case because we've There's never so talk talked about. serious yeah. about some of the legal yeah. issues that we talk about personally many times mm -hmm. or many times. So, once again, it, it's been very informative. And, Jerry, thanks a lot for being on the show. And uh, I want to thank everybody for watching us as we are well into our seventh year. And uh, once again, enjoy your summer. I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And keep all of us in your, your wine, wine cellar. cellar.